Hey again, quarantines. Um, back because I couldn't stay away. Had to uh, talk to you guys one more time about the, um, the market revolution, the first industrial revolution. I left off talking about how there is going to be far-reaching impacts about um, how society dealt with that first industrial revolution. And so back here to talk about some of those far-reaching impacts, we're going to touch on the reform movements that was really spurned by this big change in society. And I like to think about um, reform movements as reactions to what's happening in, like, in the greater society. So in the early 1800s, there was this market revolution, this first industrial revolution. There was this big change in how people were viewing the home, how people were getting money, how people were in were interacting with each other. Um, and so with that change came people who didn't like it or reactions against that change. And so we're going to go through some of those big time reactions and how those reform movements um, had lasting impacts on American society. And we'll get that get to that at the end. So first of all, when we talk about these reform movements, we can't get started talking about them without mentioning the role of religion that um, religion had on society um, in these reform movements in the early 1800s. So think back to the first great awakening in colonial America. The first great awakening is the first time that there's a cross-colonial experience. It's almost like the first... Um, American experience in our country's history that people in New York and Georgia and the Carolinas and Virginia and Massachusetts were all experiencing something similar. And so whenever the Second Great Awakening comes around in the early 1800s, um, you see again this like sweeping American experience where there are, there are religious revivals sweeping the country in the early 1800s. Some names you should know associated with the Second Great Awakening. Charles Finney was um, a prolific preacher during the Second Great Awakening. Um, but what you really see is this rise in denominations and different denominations. You have denominations from as um, kind of known and accepted today as Baptist and Methodist. Um, to things that like maybe we have a lesser understanding of today, like Mormonism and um, the move west to Utah by the Mormons. Um, you also have Millerites, you know, people who formed Christian denominations who believed that the world was ending in a few years um, and who stocked up to prepare for the end of the world. So the Second Great Awakening was far reaching. Um, but what we can definitely know is the role that religion is playing in all aspects of American society. And that religious impetus is going to spread to reform not only within churches in the form of like new denominations and changes to how we think about church, but also to other sectors of society. So let's talk about some areas of society that are changing um, in these reform movements. One is education. Right? Uh, there is a rise in public education in this time period, which makes sense. Again, all of this is being spurred by the first industrial revolution. And so um, all of that sweeping change in society is promoting this need for public education. Right? We, um, as a society, have to have um, a group of citizens that are able to vote, able to make decisions, able to read and write, and also able to function in the factory system. And so the um, there are some notable names in the education reform, um, like Noah Webster, as in like Webster's Dictionary. He starts developing textbooks that can be mass produced and sent to people in like even rural areas so that children can have educational opportunities there. And Horace Mann is a big um, advocate for public education. Horace Mann, nay, you must go to school. And so Horace Mann, um, Noah Webster, they start this sweeping reform in education and then in pressing for the need for kids to go to school. Um, also, prisons are being reformed and mental health facilities are being reformed uh, because the first industrial revolution also sees you know, a little bit of a rise in cities, like a movement towards urbanization, which means that people are closer together, which means that people see the plight that um, might happen within the prison system, within the mental health system. Dorothea Dix works to reform um, those systems. 
And a lot of that is spurred by the Second Great Awakening. Like people feel like there's an impetus from God, like the right thing to do is to advocate for public education, to reform this prison system. Also, um, very important is the temperance movement as a reform movement in the early 1800s. Um, with the rise of cities, you also see the rise of bars and um, women with their cult of domesticity uh, who are reliant on wage earners, their husbands who are wage earners, um, Women could become destitute if their husbands were to develop a drinking problem. And so uh, the people who advocated for temperance saw alcohol as the, um, as the evil, right? Like that's the reason why men are becoming um, evil is because they're engaging with alcohol. And so the temperance movement starts up in the early 1800s. The temperance movement is going to continue on into the second industrial revolution, where eventually following the second industrial revolution, the temperance movement will become successful with, um, the, with the 18th amendment and prohibition. And so, um, alcohol is the cause of a lot of People in the temperance society believe that alcohol is the cause of a lot of society's ills. And so the temperance movement is also strongly based in the religious idea of, um, you know, self-discipline, um, self-denial, you know, being like pious and on the, on the straight and narrow path. Um, and so we have all of these reforms who are trying to reform society. Um, so far we've talked about education, horseman, nay, you must go to school, Dorothea Dixon, prison reform, the temperance movement, and also women are trying to reform society to gain more rights. Some women are fed up with the cold domesticity and they would like more opportunities outside the home. Specifically, they would like political opportunities outside the home. Um, this is when Susan B. Anthony starts doing her work, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Um, the, the Seneca Falls Convention in the early 1800s sees the pinning of the Declaration of Rights and Sentiments, which women at the Seneca Falls Convention um, base the prose and the sentence structure on the Declaration of Independence to make the point that women are also humans and that they also deserve political opportunities and rights. Um, and so... The, the women's rights movement starts in this time period advocating for, for the right to vote, similar to the temperance movement. And uh, the, a lot of the temperance movement and the women's rights movement um, were together, um, a lot of overlap in the people who were advocating for those two things. The women's rights movement will not see success until the passage of the 19th Amendment in the 1920s. And so um, both of those movements start in the early 1800s and continue throughout I'm sorry, both of those movements start in the early 1800s and continue throughout the rest of the century into the early 1900s where both of those movements see eventual political success, although it takes a very, very long time. Um, at one of these women's rights conventions, though, it's worth noting um, that a really brave woman of color named Sojourner Truth stood up and she asked the people in the room, ain't I a woman? And the women's rights movement of the early 1800s caught a lot of um, flack because uh, although some of those women also advocated for abolition, some did not. And so Sojourner Truth stood up and said, ain't I a woman? As a black woman, ain't I a woman? Um, I see that like there are men here who believe like women need to be treated nicely. They need to be helped into carriages. But ain't I a woman? I'm expected to like toil in these fields give up my children. I don't have any opportunities to serve my husband. Like, um, so Jared Truth made the point that if you are advocating for equality for men and women, then you also need to be advocating for the end of slavery, which brings us to the abolition movement, which is also a hugely important reform movement in the early 1800s. Um, there are black abolitionists who are born into slavery who are advocating for the end of slavery. Nat Turner and David Walker both organized slave revolts to try and get rid of the institution of slavery. Um, Frederick Douglass is born a slave and he ends up being an advisor to Abraham Lincoln later in his life. He, um, he writes 
and speaks and advocates for the end of slavery as well. Um, William Lloyd Garrison is a is a white abolitionist. So, and he wrote the news. He published the newspaper, The Liberator, to try and spread the need to the, for the end of slavery. So, the abolition movement is in full swing in the early 1800s. Again, um, the morality of slavery was being discussed in the halls of Congress before it was even Congress. Right? I mean, with the Enlightenment ideals prior to the American Revolution, people were already acknowledging slavery as a moral wrong. Into the Constitutional Convention, there were debates about slavery as a moral wrong. Um, straight up into the early Republic, um, all the way up to the Missouri Compromise, the end of the slave trade in 1808, and then the Missouri Compromise in 1820, people were discussing in the halls of Congress at a slavery as a moral wrong. So the abolition movement is just a continuation of what is already being discussed in American society. But those abolitionists like Nat Turner, David Walker, Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, Sojourner Truth, those are people who are also fighting to reform society to end the institution of slavery. Um, with you know varying degrees of success for these different reform movements. What I want to point out here is that these are all people who are trying to reform the society they see in front of them, right? They're trying to work within society to change it, with maybe the exception of Nat Turner and David Walker because they um, organized violent uprisings to overturn a system. Um, for the most part, Dorothea, Dorothea Dix, the temperance movement, women at Seneca Falls, Horseman, and Noah Webster, and even um, religious reformers are looking at society and just trying to mold it into a slightly different society. Um, not all of these reform movements that were spurned by the first Industrial Revolution wanted to change society, though. Some people wanted to break out of society entirely. So then you start to see the rise of these utopian societies out in the wilderness. People who say, you know what? Society is straying so far from what it's supposed to be. The first industrial revolution has changed our society so much that it's not even worth reforming. We want to just break away from it and move out, um, separate from society. And so you see institutions like Brook Farm, which is like a utopian farm community where people, intellectuals, can come and farm and write and think and create art and be away from the ills of society. The Oneida community believed in free love and sharing partners and community child rearing and they just didn't see a place for themselves within American society. On the other end of that spectrum, the Shakers believed in no love, right? Not even in marriage were you um, to inter engage in um, any kind of touching or loving at all. Um, and so uh, the Oneida, the Shakers, Brook Farm, all alike believed in breaking away from society. Like there wasn't a place for them there. They couldn't reform society to make themselves fit. They wanted to just leave it. Um, and so you also see amongst all of these reform movements, um, art movements. You know, people who not only want to change society, but who want to create art to mirror society or to impact society in art's own way. And so you see the Hudson River School and um, this romantic idea of uh, the landscape and the wilderness because there's a mechanization happening in American society that we're in the midst of the first industrial revolution. And amongst that industrialization, um, art is reflecting this move to the to the wilderness to be with nature, you know, is reacting against that industrialization and moving more towards like being amongst the trees, you know. Um, along the same lines, there's a literature, the first truly American literature movement, um, transcendentalism, is sweeping uh, the American. Um, like literature landscape. And so you see people like Walt Whitman and um, uh, the transcendentalists that are like amazingly escaping my mind right now, Emerson and Thoreau, I'm sorry, um, Emerson and Thoreau and, and Whitman and, and these people who are writing to be in nature. You know, a lot of the American transcendentalists um, 
are talking about escaping from this industrialized, mechanized society, escape from all of that, and move back towards, you know, what it means to be a human in nature, right? Like within us. And so that transcendentalist movement is um, is very American and it's in its culture. And so that begs the final question with all of these reform movements, you know, this the time period that we're in, time period four, from 1800 into 1848, it talks about the formation of a national identity. And so the question I have for you is, is this our national identity? Is reform movements our national identity? Is the limited success of the reform movements? Um, is people who are willing to break away from society entirely and venture into the wilderness to be themselves like the Shakers and the Oneida and Brook Farm? Um, is the transcendentalist idea of being um, an individual in nature out on your own um, totally reliant on yourself, is that what it means to be an American? These reform movements in the early 1800s are a reaction against the first industrial revolution, right? The industrialization of our society pushes people back onto the frontier, back into nature, you know, or pushes people to reflect on what do we want our society to look like? You know, we want our society to be one free from alcohol, or do we want our society want to be where we take care of people who are mentally ill, or we make sure that everybody has opportunities to have an equal education, or we have equal voting opportunities for men and women, or we have um, an abolition of unjust institutions, moral depravity is going to end in our country. What does it mean to be an American? You know, what does American art look like? What is our national identity? Is it all of these reform movements together? Is it some of these reform movements? Ultimately, as an American, that's for you to decide. Okay, young person, um, if you join our office hours, then we will be able to flush that out a little bit more. It's going to be the top of our discussion. Forming a national identity. Are we reformers as Americans at our heart? What a great question. Talk to you guys later.